Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. It is a cold morning in Minnesota. It literally turned to fall overnight <laughs> after Monday. So welcome to fall um, up here in Minnesota. But uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jen Green. I'm with Property House Partners. We are located in the Twin Cities Metro here in Minnesota. We are a locally owned real estate investment firm. We help out folks who need to sell their homes quickly for cash or terms, whether it's a bankruptcy, an inherited home, a looming foreclosure, divorce, any of those situations where you're looking for a quick sale, we're able to help. Sitting next to me here is Bob Everhart, um, and I'm going to be interviewing him in a little bit. And you guys saw the title here. We're going to be talking about all things title. Um, Bob and I actually met through a probate case not too long ago, and we just started talking and told me about his expertise in title issues. And we just had a really long, nice conversation about title. So I thought it would be a really good idea to bring him on because I think there's a lot of things that investors don't know about and also just residential folks who are looking for properties or those who are looking to sell. It's really important to know some of these key pieces that we're going to talk about today when it comes to selling your home, especially an inherited home when you don't necessarily what's going know what's going on with the house. Um, so welcome, Bob. It's really nice to see you. I guess see you, right? Yes. Yes. Good morning. Uh, yeah. How are you today? Doing well? Quite well. Good, good. All right. So I wanted to start out with, you know, I mean, I know you've kind of, you've practiced for a long time since 87 and you've kind of made some, you know, changes over the year and most, most recently started doing some pro probate work, but you have, you know, a background in, in bankruptcy, in real estate, business succession planning. And from what I know about you, you kind of went right into title stuff right after law school. Is that right? That's correct. I, that was my first job out of law school. I worked for a major title company here as an examiner uh, for about two years. Okay. And it was a great learning experience. Uh, knew basically nothing about, uh, about title issues or real estate, despite taking a number of classes on real estate in law school. Um, but I, uh, I got tired of telling people you need to hire an attorney to fix this problem and wanted to go out and, and fix them myself. Well, perfect. So, I mean, you really specialize in title issues. Is it more about just fig? I know you said you really like to solve problems. Was that kind of what brought you to title? Just really kind it of is. Through stuff? It, yeah. No, it, it, it definitely is. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a uh, area where lots of different things come together and it's uh, uh, the background in bankruptcy. Uh, uh, it's, uh, bankruptcy is one of those black holes of uh, everybody knows the words and that there's, they are problems, but that's right. the extent of it. So when uh, a bankruptcy issue gets up, uh, gets called as a title problem, I know about it from the other end of representing people in bankruptcy and, and that, uh, there's always a solution to a problem. It's just a matter of how to get to point B. Right. So, I mean, when it comes to title issues, obviously you've probably seen everything. What do you think would be, you know, some of the largest title issues that you see when folks are selling homes that you've had to fix? Probably the most common is judgments. A lot of times people aren't aware that they've got sued. Um, the, uh, uh, if somebody has filed bankruptcy, there's a very, very quick uh, procedure to make that no longer be a judgment, or I'm sorry, no longer be a title problem. Okay. The issue there is the bankruptcy is in federal court, and yes, you're you know that creditor's ability to garnish your wages or do things like that was taken away in the bankruptcy, but the judgment's still sitting there in state court and the two courts don't talk to each other to essentially docket that federal bankruptcy discharge into the state court. And if you've not filed bankruptcy, um, but this property is your home, then uh, there is another procedure that essentially it's asking a court to find that this is your homestead and most judgments do not attach to it. Uh, there are some some exceptions, child support liens, uh, taxes, mechanics liens, that sort of thing. 
but uh, uh, when somebody sees you know, twenty thousand dollars of judgments uh, on there and that uh, the deal is going to go away, well, no, it doesn't need to. It's uh, a matter of working through. And what typically happens with that is I talk with the title company and explain what I plan to do, and give a letter of undertaking. Mm-hmm. They'll oftentimes to be uh, an escrow to secure that it gets uh, gets completed and successful. But uh, in that, the only way that they can, uh, that the creditor could object to it is to say that you were not living in the house or that even though I look like a credit card, I'm really child support or something like that. Right. So it, it happened. It's, uh, it's a default process. So for those of you just joining us, that was a lot of knowledge that Bob just dropped, um, and I appreciate that very much. We're talking about title issues and um, how they relate to homes when you're trying to sell, and if title, if you come up with title and you're trying to sell and it's clouded, meaning that you can't close on your property, there's a lot of things that you can do to clear the title so that it can be sold. Now, if anybody has any questions during this broadcast, please feel free to post them in the comments and we'll get those answers for you. And if not, Katie, um, is going to be posting information of how to get a hold of Bob in the comments here as well. And then this is also going to be put onto our website and it'll also have information there of how you can get a hold of Bob as well. So Bob, the other thing, I mean, we kind of started talking about what I really wanted to, what I really wanted to dig into today was that, you know, most people don't know, and I think even investors and and lay folks don't know that you cannot have, in Minnesota at least, that you cannot have a judgment tied to a home on a homestead property, correct? That is correct. Okay. So, and I've run across this. I had um, a short sale property that I was helping a family with, and they had two different judgments that were tied to their home, and we had to work really hard to get those to get those out. So what's the, what does that process look like? I know you kind of got into it a little bit, but you know, would it be an attorney that you work with, or do you think it's better to go through title? Is there paperwork that has to be done? What is what is that? What does that look like? What are those first steps? Well, that's a that's a real good question. Um, uh, just generally with title issues, the earlier you know about it, the better. So if you have a property, uh, uh, there is uh, a uh, f- through the courts. There's a judgment search that you can do for free. And then you'll know if there's a judgment against this person. And you know that this is an issue before you get to the point of getting a title commitment saying that. All of these things take time. Uh, so the earlier you know about it, the better. If that's the case, then the, uh, so you've, you've got this potential property with the owner, you find out that they have a judgment, you confirm with them that it is their judgment. Uh, oftentimes it's just a similar name in which case, say, uh, or another person with the same name, in which okay. case typically a title company will take uh, an affidavit of non-identity. I'm not that person um, uh, to sell that. Uh, if it is that person, then we can get working on, on, um, on the homestead action and have that uh, perhaps even completed by the time, um, by the time that they're ready to close. Okay. Would there be any way that, you know, the judgment would fight that? Because I think, you know, in the general public, I mean, this is something you and I talked about too. You're like, wow, you know, a lot of people don't know that. And for me personally too, I didn't really know it until I came across it. And so, you know, why is it that you think that, I mean, because I think people are like, oh, we'll just pay it and move on. Is that kind of what they're hoping for, I would think? Well, um, I think it's, um, uh, the best way of putting it is it's so drummed into people's head that, oh, there's a judgment in the county, it's a lien on your house. And there is a law that it is a lien um, on, your, on any real estate that you own in that county where the judgment's docketed. However, then if you get a finding that this piece of real estate is your homestead mm-hmm. and this judgment does not attach to it, so it's a matter of, uh, of just um, people not taking the second step and just saying, oh, it's a problem. And that's, that's the first thing everybody thinks of is uh, just paying it off. Right. And if it's small enough, that may be the best way of doing it. But if you're talking about a $20,000 judgment, uh, it's certainly worth doing the homestead action. 
Okay. And just to reiterate what Bob and I are talking about, we just really clearly said that if you have a homestead property and there is a judgment on that and you are trying to sell, they cannot tie a judgment to your homestead property. Now, again, if you own other real estate, right, that's not your homestead, meaning your rain residence, that can be tied to that real estate. So I just wanted to reiterate that for you folks, because like I said, that's something that a lot of folks don't know about. So anybody, like I said, who's looking to purchase a property, whether it's an investment or a personal home or whatever it is, know that when you do your title search, make sure that your title company is aware of that because sometimes they don't know that either, I found, which is unfortunate and they should, um, but just something to ask about when you're looking into that. Okay, so in terms of liens and judgments and all of that kind of stuff, you know, when it comes to, I just want to keep talking kind of on this, this same line here, because, you know, I've also come across houses that have medical assistance liens on them, right? And I know this is something that can be tied, right, to a homestead property, correct? That is correct. It's, um, uh, yes, is the short answer. And they are, uh, the counties are under real strict rules about wh what they can do. It's not, you're not gonna get as good of uh, a deal as if it was a credit card. Uh, there, sure. There's uh, ultimate flexibility and, and the homestead action that you can get rid of it. There are certain, um, uh, essentially the county, again, within those, those, that framework is allowed to use its kind of its business judgment. Meaning if you have a deal where they have to bend on this property. You know, for instance, they have to bend on it. Otherwise, the whole property is going to be lost to foreclosure. Uh -huh. That's a circumstance where they may take less. Uh, they may bend. Um, they won't bend just so you can make more money off of the deal. Um, right. So that, that's kind of the thing. So it's not a definite no, but it's it's a pretty pretty fine um, fine uh, needle to to put your thread through. Right, and I, yeah, to just kind of say that too, I mean, a lot of the times when we've, cause we've negotiated some MA liens as well and it's really always been in a situation of foreclosure, right? Because otherwise it's, you get something or you get nothing, unfortunately. Um, but yes, I would agree with that when that's where they're a little bit more lenient, I would say, right? To get something. There are certain circumstances where like a co-owner is the, was the caregiver of the of the other owner who has the medical assistance lien, yeah. where they, there, there are some exceptions to that too. So, can you? About, can, sorry, go, I go was ahead. gonna say that I think that's a really good point to bring up in terms of how you own a house, whether it's you know a joint tenant or you know other ways. So, can you maybe just talk about that a little bit more in terms of what that would look like? Well, um, as there's there's a number of issues there, and. Um, uh, the as far as putting somebody else in the on title, uh, the five year look back for qualifying for medical assistance applies. So that that gets complicated. Right. It, when somebody is on title, even if you just did it uh, you know, to avoid probate or something like that, they are an owner of that property. And so if they file bankruptcy, for instance, mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. an interest in real estate that potentially could go to the bankruptcy trustee. Likewise, with judgments or tax liens or that sort of thing. Okay. So it's something to be very careful about. Um, uh, there's a great tool of uh, transfer on death deeds, which operate like you're typically it's parents putting their children on uh, uh, so that when both, after both parents have passed away then uh, the kids get the house without going through probate. Uh, you do have to be careful um, with that because that, if there's a medical assistance lien, that does need to be taken care of before the kids can sell it. Right. Um, but there are different ways of doing it and everything has its pluses and minuses. There you do have to be careful with the kids that they all agree to sell the house. Um, if you've done that and they don't agree, uh, then there's another um, legal action called a partition, where okay. one owner can force the sale of the property. And as a practical matter, if as in the course of that, uh, even though you're asking for the property to be ordered to be sold, 
if the other parties buy you out, you know, you you've gotten your share of the essentially the proceeds and and you've gotten out of the property and you've liquidated, you've gotten the money that you were looking for. Okay. Again, there are layers and different solutions to different problems. Right. So, I mean, when it comes to those, then would you say, I mean, the order in which, you know, liens or judgments on a property need to be taken care of, I mean, typically taxes are usually always going to be first, right? Typically, yes. Yeah. Okay. So then what's the kind of the, because I know like, especially in probate too, I've, you know, since you do probate as well, I've seen just in terms of clearing that title and different things like that of where the proceeds from the house have to go to, there is an order, kind of a succession of what has to be paid off after, you know, a sale of a home, correct? Uh, there, there is, and that's, uh, now that won't hold up the, necessarily hold up the sale of the house. Right. It's only if they have liens on the house that that's an issue. But uh, yes, when there's, um, when there's, um, uh, when kind there's the person. proceeds, yeah. to the estate, right. then it's a matter of typically the expenses of the last uh, illness and funeral is the top priority, then any uh, federal or state taxes, and then uh, general creditors after that. Okay. Now, is there anything else like in, you know, I know we kind of touched on, you know, some bankruptcy topics as well. Um, is there anything that would hold up, like if somebody wanted to save their home, Right? And a lot of people file bankruptcy to do that. Is there anything that would prohibit that sale from happening? Um, or excuse me, if they wanted to sell in that case, like if they're filing bankruptcy, is there anything that prohibits that sale if they you know, were to file bankruptcy and for some reason they weren't able to sell their or keep their house? Um, their uh, bankruptcy is often a tool to accomplish exactly that. Uh, there's a form of bankruptcy called chapter 13 Mm -hmm. uh, which is available for anybody with a regular source of income. And with that, you make a plan where you make monthly payments to a trustee for a three to five year period who then pays out to your creditors. Now, the importance for saving your house is any form of bankruptcy. When you, as soon as you file, there's something called the automatic stay. And that's the order to all the creditors to stop whatever they are doing to collect on their debt. So if it's the, the night before your, um, before your sheriff sale and you file the bankruptcy, they can't have the sheriff sale. So that'll essentially, not quite indefinitely, but for a long time, uh, hold off the foreclosure. And if you're able to make the mortgage payments and you use your plan to get caught up on the back mortgage payments, conceivably you could save your house uh, and never have to sell it. Uh, if it's just a matter of, you know, I need 90 days to sell it, you certainly uh, would be able to slow the process down yeah. uh, enough to accomplish that sale. Okay. Well, that's great. So, I mean, we're kind of getting to the end of our time. This has gone by really quickly. Um, are there any parting words that you feel like would be really beneficial for the folks who are watching to just, you know, whether it's title or bankruptcy that they should keep their eyes and ears open for, whether they're looking to sell or looking to buy? Well, uh, two things. One is, again, look early. Um, I had a deal once where uh, there was a trust that the owners actually weren't aware of that they had put their house in the trust, but the realtor had looked at the property tax statement and that was the official taxpayer was the trust of you know, Joe Smith. Right. And so by that, we were able to figure that out and they had done some other things that caused problems with the trust, but we were able to fix it before the closing. Um, so look early. Uh, and also I just invite if, if anybody has something they're questioning on a title commitment or just a weird issue, feel free to, uh, typically email works best. Okay. If you have a document, uh, feel free to send it to me and, yeah. and ask, what does this mean? Um, I, I tell you when the clock starts running. So I do, uh, I do look at things for free just to see if I can fix, fix it and give some basic, um, this is what it is. Right. Um, and uh, usually that works better than a phone call because there's, the names of, of things make a lot of difference. And if you don't have the name exactly right, 
of what the problem is, uh, then you know it, it's very difficult to answer the question. But okay. feel free to shoot them to me, and I'll I'll see what I can do. Sounds great. And like I said, for those three folks who are watching, we're going to have Bob's information in our comments, and then we'll also transfer this to our website as well, and it'll be under our interview with the experts section on our website. Um, thank you so much, Bob, for joining us today. This was really, really great. Um, I think there's a lot of information here that maybe perhaps people didn't know about. That's why I thought it was so important to share it, because the general public really doesn't know about these judgments and things like that on, on homestead properties and filing bankruptcy and all of that. So. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us, Bob. We really appreciate having you on. Thank you, Jen. And I look for, forward to our next deal. Absolutely. And for those folks um, who are looking for a way to get a hold of us at Property House, you can always contact us by email, um, hello at propertyhousepartners.com or Property House Investments. Either one works. And then also, um, you can reach us on Facebook. You can send me a personal message. And then also you can check out our YouTube channel that has short answer questions um, to some of the stuff that we go over since sometimes I know it's really hard to thumb through these um, long lives when they're usually about 20 or 25 minutes. You can always reach us there on Property House Partners. And then also obviously Facebook and Instagram, we have a lot of our before and after pictures. Um, next week, we're gonna be talking about the housing market and client updates. Obviously, um, we see that the CDC put something out for evictions going until the end of December. So I'm going to dig into that a little bit more and let you guys know what that means. Um, until then, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. And if there's any questions or comments or anything, like I said, please post them on this feed and we'll be happy to get back to you. Thanks again, Bob, and have a great rest of your week, guys. We'll see you next time.